So I'm Lorraine. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I run the Thyroid Trust along with an amazing group of volunteers and supported by a fantastic board of trustees, uh, a couple of whom are here with us today. We've got Judith Taylor, who's our chair of trustees, and also Teresa Baker, who's uh, one of our founding trustees. Um, and we're a patient-led organisation, uh, but we also work very closely with the medical profession. We have a couple of medics on our board of trustees and um, we're quite a new little charity, um, but we are trying very hard um, to make as much noise as we can about thyroid disease, to raise the profile of thyroid conditions, um, raise more awareness, um, try and provide as many events like this as we can, where we get fantastic expert speakers to come along and tell people things that they might not otherwise know about either latest research or just basic things that we should all know about thyroid disease. Um, and we do patient talks and, and things as well. And we have in, informal events where people can just chat amongst themselves too. Um, We've only been registered since 2019, so we're still quite new, but as a group of patients, we've been around and doing stuff together for about 10 years. Um, so we're very excited to now have our very own charity. And we're uh, so thrilled that all of you have decided to support us by coming along today. And I know some of you have really kindly made a donation to attend as well, which is really kind of you. We're not a membership organization because we don't want to restrict who we can support. And it's really important to us that anyone who wants to come to one of these events can come and that, that's why we don't charge a fee, but we are incredibly grateful when people make a donation. So thanks so much to those of you who did. Um, exceptionally grateful to our speaker today, who is Dr. Pete Taylor um, from Cardiff University. And Pete is a fantastic endocrinologist who we've known for quite a long time, who's spoken at um, events that I've organized in the past um, and also often gives talks to um, groups of endocrinologists. He was just speaking at the British Thyroid Association um, conference last week. And um, you, you did a talk at the European Congress as well, didn't you, Pete? Yes, I, I was there. I just my brains are scrambled from so much going on over the last few days. And um, so we're really um, very privileged <laughs> to have um, Pete talking to us today. Um, he's a practicing endocrinologist, but he's also an epidemiologist, which means he, he studies um, you know, sort of statistics and public health. Um, and he is also a researcher and he's recently completed um, a very interesting and important new study into um, thyroid uh, levothyroxine and what that does with, with cholesterol. So he's going to give us a talk about that, which is going to be great. So I'll get, I'll get started then. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, a Pete, I'm an endocrinology consultant based in the Heath in Cardiff. I also do a fair bit of research in epidemiology, and I'm quite interested in looking at variation in thyroid status and how it matters. And um, that's kind of been one of my focuses for the last few years. Um, a lot of people know that thyroid function and cholesterol are very intimately linked, and the actual take home message is um, yes, improving your thyroid function improves your cholesterol. That's quite a short talk. But um, the key thing to have you all thinking about things is um, what can cholesterol tell us about thyroid function? which may certainly uh, raise a few questions for all of you and sort of tell you about where we're going, because I think we're at a bit of a tipping point, perhaps, and where things might start to get a bit more exciting and in thyroid. And uh, we'll see what you all think. So it's been really nice to have the chance to talk to you all, see what you all think. And um, yeah, happy to have a chat with you all afterwards as well. So without further ado. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but thyroid hormones are really, really important. It's essential in your mood. It's essential in how your heart works and how well it pumps. It's essential when or not you get osteoporosis. It's critical during childhood and development, and it's crucially affected with weight, metabolism, and cholesterol. And best of all, it turns tadpoles into frogs. So if you think about all the changes thyroid hormone can have, that's pretty darn potent. So if you do want giant killer tadpoles, put a bit of your carbimazole in your pond and you'll end up with giant killer tadpoles and much and must have for any future planning bond villain. Um, so there we go. Thyroid hormones are small things, but they're pretty darn mighty. Um, I'm going to try and go through a little bit. Most of you will know all of this already, but just to highlight kind of a lot of what I'll be talking about relates to TSH, which comes from the pituitary gland, which then tickles the thyroid to make T3 and T4. You'll see that TSH appears in slightly bigger letters than T3 and T4. That's because the way it works with the, with the thyroid axis, um, small changes in T3 and T4 result in theory a much bigger change in TSH. 
So it's usually a better way of being able to see what's going on. And I know there's some criticism of the TSH test, but it's um, it's a good starting point to work through. And we'll go through all of that um, in the talk. And basically, abnormal thyroid function and abnormal cholesterol, we've known about this for decades. And if you've got either abnormal thyroid function, doctors will almost always do a knee-jerk reaction and check your cholesterol. Vice versa, if I see someone on the medical tape with a high cholesterol, I'll often get the thyroid checked as well, just to make sure. And it's well known that if you treat overt hypothyroidism with levothyroxine, your lipid profile will improve. Um, so that's kind of just the first thing to be thinking about. Note the use of use there is overt hypothyroidism will improve your lipids. If you've got borderline subclinical hypothyroidism, we're actually a little bit less sure about that. It will have a very marginal effect. But one of the things when you've got a failing thyroid, so this is someone who's not on any treatment and the TSH goes up, you'll tend to put up your T3 as well as your T4. And actually, we don't see such dramatic effects on your lipids. But it's interesting what we might see if you're on levothyroxine alone. So this is a really nice study by Bjorn Asvold, and he's based in the Hunt study. And basically, the Hunt study is a, an area of northern Norway, which is so nice. There's fjords, there's, there's lovely trees. Everyone there lives there. And basically, the Norwegian government did a massive cohort study there because nobody ever left. So they had this wonderful group of people, and they followed them up for years and years. And it's about 30,000 Nor Norwegians were enrolled in this. It's a really nice big study. And what it shows, as you can see on this axis, this is your non-HDL cholesterol. This is the bad cholesterol, effectively. And what we can see, particularly in men, if your TSH is higher, i.e. lower thyroid function, you have a higher cholesterol. We do see it in women, and women have a slightly better cholesterol than men, one of the reasons perhaps why they live longer, but the effect is actually slightly lower in women. But what we can see here, even, and for those of you who know your thyroid reference ranges, we're looking at about half the adult reference range between 0.5 and 3.5, but we can see a measurable dif dis uh, difference in cholesterol. So looking at that now, then looking at your good cholesterol, you kind of see it's not quite as clear, but it's the other way around. There's a bit of a downward slope. So higher TSH, lower thyroid function, you tend to have a wee bit less of the good cholesterol. So you'll have more bad cholesterol and less good cholesterol if your thyroid function's at the top of the reference range. Now, taking that forward as well, we actually see the same thing with blood pressure. So again, this is your TSH again, and this is the same group again. And what you can see is as your TSH goes higher, again, lower thyroid function, you can see your systolic blood pressure creeps up as well. And to put that in context, the difference we see is actually about half the effect of amlodipine. Some of you may be on it. It's one of my favorite blood pressure drugs. Um, it's a really nice, safe drug. And basically, the variation is, is about half the adult reference range. And actually, what you can see here, um, I'm sorry, I can never resist in doing some statistics, the people who've got a slightly higher thyroid, uh, higher TSH, i.e. lower thyroid function, have a 66% increased risk compared to the background population of having uh, ischemic heart disease events. So compared to those with sort of lower TSH, sort of higher thyroid function, we do see a difference in um, coronary heart disease events as well. So these risk factors may or may not be playing a part here that the higher cholesterols, the higher blood pressure, is that perhaps driving some of the explanation why there's more ischemic heart disease? So just from the first couple of slides, just to sort of anchor ourselves, I think just to remind you that we are assessing things clinically by the pituitary hormone TSH, and remember it's the wrong way around, so higher TSH, lower thyroid function, but also we're looking at the uh, free thyroid hormones as well, which haven't been studied as much in a lot of these cohorts. And I think this is something that we need to actually get better with our research. And what I want to just anchor is that even fairly modest variation in thyroid status is associated with detectable differences in cholesterol and blood pressure. And that's probably quite important at the population level, but for the individual, it's sort of, it's, it's less clear. The other thing to think about as well, though, is cholesterol and blood pressure are really easy things to measure. More complex things like energy level, fatigue, mood, they are much harder to measure. And at the moment, and it's just quite embarrassing, frankly, we still don't know if treating subclinical hypothyroidism improves hard cardiovascular outcomes. It's a bit of a failure of endocrinology. The TRUST study was in a more elderly population. That's the biggest trial that's been done at the moment. That didn't show any benefit. 
whether or not we'd see something in a younger population, that's, that would have been the choice of the population that I would have done for that study. But unfortunately, it was done in an older population study. So we still don't know. So we can't say for certain. But what we can say is if your thyroid function is slightly out of kilter, we can see a measurable effect on your cholesterol and we can see a measurable effect on your blood pressure, even within the, even within the reference range. And one would expect as you fall out of the reference range, those effects to be get more magnified. So this is a nice slide. Um, this is from the really nice um, endocrinologist by Anderson. And I'm reliably told these were all based on medical students who failed their exams. So they all couldn't afford to have any, any of their time based uh, in stay on in the hall of residence. So he paid them to uh, have the bloods taken. And this is one individual here. This is their T4 level. And this was it taken over a 12 month period. And that's what their range is. This bigger area here is actually in white, is the actual population reference range of all those medical students. So this shows us two things. One in black here, you can see my mouse cursor moving, that actually an individual oscillates around a very narrow set point. Your thyroid function does not shift that much in health. The population spread is quite wide. So I think for all thyroid patients, the $64 million question is, if I'm normal, but not normal for me, how does that affect me? And if my thyroid function um, goes outside of normal of my normality, but is still open speech marks normal, does that affect me as well? And we generally don't know the answer to that. One would expect the effects to be fairly modest, but it'd be very interesting to point out that if you're used to running at one thyroid set point and we bring you back to normality, but it's not yours, are you possibly going to potentially feel that? And you don't need many people to be able to see that effect. And the UK is actually in a bit of a, a state. We are one of the most hypothyroid nations in the world. It's something that, you know, unlike Eurovision, we've got a chance of winning. Um, what we've got there, so the darker the colour of the blue, the more hypothyroid we are. And we're running at a prevalence of hypothyroidism about 4% which is pretty high. 1% of all pregnant women are on levothyroxine. And if you look at older women in their 80s, the prevalence goes up much higher than that. Compared to lots of the country, we are the world, we are quite hypothyroid. We are also getting more hypothyroid every year. There's more of us being picked up. So it was 2.5%. We're now heading towards 4%. And at the current rate of trajectory, we're going to be well over 55 6% by 2030. Um, is across all nations of the UK, but we've done a little map here. The redder colour you are, the more hypothyroid your region is. So God knows what's happening around the granite areas of sort of uh, northeast Scotland, but uh, their thyroids are struggling a bit. You can see London because it's got a slightly younger population, perhaps, and uh, sort of more ethnically diverse, tends to slightly lower rates of thyroid function. But a lot of the UK does a fairly sporting rates of hypothyroidism, some as high as 6% and it's getting more and more common. So the fact is that every year we're influencing people's thyroid function a lot more by putting them on levothyroxine. And this is something we need to start thinking about. Oh, sorry, my screen's frozen. So if you go on levothyroxine, there's now increasing evidence that although normalization of TSH, if you think about it, that's been our goal and that's been our dogma. If we find someone with abnormal thyroid function, uh, low thyroid function that is, the trick is, isn't it, to um, Put you to put them on levothyroxine and get the TSH to be normal. That's kind of what, and it, and it sounds quite simple. And I think for a lot of people, it is that simple. It does seem to work. However, there's quite a lot of people, and this is one of the reasons why having this group in the BTF and everything else, we do see lots of people that go, I'm better than I was, but I'm not quite right. So this is one of the things I'm interested in seeing whether or not we can find out why that might be the case. So what is quite interesting is, going back to that, that, those graphs of those medical students I showed, is that normalization of TSH doesn't necessarily restore complete normality. And there was quite a nice large American study that was done by Peterson. And they looked at people who had hypothyroidism, were put on levothyroxine, and then got a normal TSH. So as far as we were all concerned, we fixed them. They're back to normal. All should be good. But actually, when you compare them to sort of age and match controls, they had a couple of things that stood out that were quite different. 
One, and I think a lot of you will know this, is that you have a low T3 to free T4 ratio. Because levothyroxine is T4, and that's the only hormone that gets given primarily, as a result of that, you'll have a normal TSH, but your T3 will be quite low and your T4 will be quite high, and you really see a difference in the ratio. They're all, interestingly, overall, report a higher BMI, despite when you look at the diet sheets, taking a slightly lower calorie intake. So people with hypothyroidism do report a higher BMI, despite an equivalent or lower calorie intake than controls. Interestingly, they're more likely to be on statins, which is a bit odd because, you know, may, uh, which is a bit of why they should be on statins because we normalize the TSH. And they're also more likely to be on antidepressants than the general population. Pete, can I just jump in for a second? Yeah. Some, somebody in the chat asked a question, what is low T3? And I know lots of people on the chat will know about that, but just to you just sort of explain that briefly uh, for, for, for those. Sorry, who thanks, Lorraine. Yeah, subject. please, if anything comes up, ask again to ask. So, um, when you've got levothyroxine, that's T4, but your thyroid produces two hormones, T3 and T4. T4 is the one that's considered to be um, the most effective one for replacement because the argument is T4 gets converted into T3, but it's T3 that does all the work inside cells for various reasons that is probably going to cover in the questions and it's probably a talk in its own right. Yeah, it's totally. quite hard to make T3 um, as a drug. It's less stable. So we've tended to rely on the T4 and hope the T4 gets converted to T3 and T3 does its job in the tissues. But one of the problems of giving people just T4, although we fix the TSH and get it back to normal, you'll run quite a low T3. So that's why some people don't like how they feel in the end upon T3 as well. So um, your lower T4, if you are on levothyroxine and your TSH is normal, you'll tend to run a low normal or a slightly low T3 level as well. Does that does that cover the question? See who was asked the question. Um, Elizabeth is saying thank you. So I think that's a yes. Okay, okay. we can cover that again in the question. So yeah, we, we, I'm sure we'll we'll get into to more of that as, as we go on. I just didn't want somebody sitting there no. not knowing what T3 was. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. And again, please just jump in at any point along the way. So, so that's quite interesting. So although we have, according to our guidelines, fixed people, we do see this slight aberration in the biochemistry, which is detectable on the bloods in the T3, T4 ratio. We've got this interesting BMI problem. We've got this predominance to be on statins. And there's also an increase in antidepressant use compared to the general population. The one slight problem is that people who have their thyroid function measured are not normal. Um, so if you ever had your thyroid function checked, I'm delighted to be able to tell you, you are slightly more intelligent than the average member of the population. You're slightly richer and you're more likely to uh, be female and you're more likely to be white. So if you have your thyroid function checked, congratulations, your GP thought you're slightly intelligent. But the downside for this is, I'm just not bringing up my slide again, sorry, here we go. This is an interesting study we did called the depth study. Um, now, the depth study was a really great cheap study. So um, if you see this axis on the side, this is an axis of misery. The higher you are on the axis, the more miserable you are. So we just got GP phlebotomists every time they had a someone have a thyroid function check for the first time, they got the patient to fill out the questionnaire. So this is people who a GP has gone, you need to get your thyroid checked. And what you can see is that people of their thyroid checked are not feeling quite right. They are more miserable than the background population. And we know that because thyroid and misery and depression and fatigue are all linked in together. So having your thyroid function checked is a marker actually of misery and a marker that things aren't going great. Interestingly, it's not a marker of having an underactive thyroid. So GPs are testing a lot of people. And the problem we've got is that induces a bias in a lot of these studies because we've got a group of highly educated people who get their thyroid function checked who are struggling. And this, that creates any noise in any studies that we do, which is why we have endocrinologists arguing about things and why we've not really solved all these problems is because when we look at all these cohort studies, we've got this bias induced simply because the people who have their thyroid function checked aren't quite happy with how things are going and things aren't going great at the moment at the point when they have the bloods done. And they all tend to be slightly more affluent, slightly more intelligent. So that induces a problem. So it's hard to say what's causing what. Is it the low T3 status that's causing the problem? 
Or is it the fact that it's something else going on that's causing you to be thyroid checked? And that's kind of what we're trying desperately to unpick. So just to take home another from these few slides, we all have a fairly narrow set point. The normal range, therefore, may not be normal for the individual. And it's genuinely unclear how much this matters. I think it matters enough to do a lot more research onto this. And with genetics, we might be able to predict what your normal range should be. And we're doing some work involved with that. And normalization of TSH with T4 doesn't restore a normal system. You've got a low T3, you've got a higher BMI you tend to, and you tend to um, have a greater use of statins. And there's a lot of bias in people being tested for thyroid disease. And again, that makes one of the studies in thyroid disease a lot harder to work out. So taking it forward, um, we've actually done things with, with, uh, with rats. So we've actually taken out the thyroid and we've taken out the thyroid completely. And despite giving them levothyroxine, we were not able to restore their normal T3 levels in either the blood or the tissue. Um, we could see that in liver, and that's important for cholesterol. We see it in muscle, and we see it in brain biopsies. We cannot get it to normal. Interestingly, if the rats were overdosed with levothyroxine, their T3 level and tissue levels became normal, but they only achieved that by running a much higher T4 than would normally be given. So you can get there, but you have very odd thyroid function. So this, I'm going to take a little bit. So this is a little bit of epidemiology teaching for us all. So if you can all see these funny little dots and lines. So the dot points to what we think the answer is. So the dot points to an estimate. The wider the line shows how confident we are in that. So if you've got a very tiny, tiny set of lines, like the one Chrissy Act 2012, you've got a dot and two very small. Well, that means we are very confident with that result. That means that result is a large study usually. Whereas you look at the one below it by Liu in 1998, those lines are wide, so we're not very confident in that study. Um, if Lorraine can be speak on behalf of everyone and nod your head if that makes sense, are you happy with that or do I need to go through that again? No, I'll tell you what, it, it makes sense to me because I've, I've sat through lots of these presentations and it probably makes sense to maybe sort of 90% of the people in the room, but it is probably just worth it explaining for, for people who haven't been to talks like this before. So the, the list of names, Abdel, Gayum, down to Zulaveski, that's the names of authors of different studies and the years are... Exactly when they were done. Um, and then what you're basically saying is if there's a little short line then you're probably quite confident in the results of that study. It was probably quite a big study. Exactly. Um, and there's lots of different studies that have given slightly varying results. And that's kind of how, how science finds things out, isn't it? It's like if somebody quotes one study and says, I know this because this study says it, then they need to be aware that actually scientists look at lots of different studies before they draw conclusions. And I think that's something that a lot of people who don't have a scientific background, that's, that's quite new information for us. So and th this represents kind of the gold standard, because basically you'll have some people arguing about, say, the Mehmet study that's over one side and others arguing about one that was maybe on the other side. But this takes a look at every single study done on the topic. And we get this lovely little diamond at the bottom. And the key thing that you can see is the diamond is is based on an average of all the above. And it can just see it's all on that dotted line. It's all on that left hand side. And that indicates a very sort of high level of confidence. We can be very confident with this finding that people on levothyroxine, despite a normal TSH, have a higher LDL than the background population that is matched for them. So going on levothyroxine compared to not being on levothyroxine slightly pushes up your bad cholesterol. Now, it's probably worse to have an untreated thyroid, and certainly overt it would be, so it, it, it means that you are maybe slightly less bad than you otherwise would be, but it's still not perfect. And somebody was just asking the question in the chat and saying, were these studies on people with any comorbidities? And, and I would imagine if you're looking at some large studies that that, yeah. that, that was sort of adjusted for. Can you explain Absolutely, that? they've been adjusting for. So basically, this is just comparing the different areas. One group of people are effectively the background population. These are people who are on levothyroxine, but with a normal TSH. And what we can see is they're running, uh, when you aggregate all the data, all these studies together, they're running a slightly higher LDL. 
Now, if you've got someone with a high TSH and they've got proper hypothyroidism, you'll improve the LDL anyway, but you don't quite get it back to normality. Now, interestingly, in the subgroup of people with a suppressed TSH, they didn't have a raised cholesterol. So people who are on enough levothyroxine to push the TSH to below the reference range, below what we normally recommend, they don't have a cholesterol problem. The point to make as well is it's only a very minor effect of your cholesterol. So if you're on levothyroxine, been on it for years, and you're savvy and conscious about your cholesterol, perfectly good to get it checked, but it, it might not mean you need to do anything about it. It's just something we would normally recommend checking in clinic. And it's much less than, say, the effect of a statin. So if you ever did need anything, a statin will more, will more than cover it. It's more than ample. It's only a marginal difference, but it's a difference we can see. And that gives us clues about what's going on. So this is kind of one of my points I like to try and make. So this is when you get a blood test for your thyroid check. This is measures your T4 and your T3. And we also measure your TSH, which comes from your brain flogging your thyroid. The trouble is actually there's quite a lot that goes on in your tissues beyond the blood. So the blood only takes us so far. So you've got special uh, transporters that pump your T4 from your blood into your cells and you pump your T3 from the blood into your cells. And note that actually your T4, once inside, actually gets converted to T3. Now, for those of you who've been coming to lots of talks and those of you who've been doing a lot of work on, on your thyroid and know it all well, you'll see there that there's something called D2, which is DIO2. And some of you may have been tested for this DIO2 SNP that we're interested in because we think potentially there's a genetic common variant that means you're not quite so good at converting T4 to T3. So for instance, in that scenario, should that be the way that you are, if you're on levothyroxine and you've got a relatively high T4 and a low T3, if you've not got a good function of that variant, you might not be able to get past that block terribly well. So your T3 will be doubly low, one, because you're struggling to convert it from the T4, and two, you've not got as much T3 going in. The problem we have is when we measure the DI2 people go, they're not so good. They may have it and that's great. But if they don't have it and they still don't feel right, is it because they've actually got a problem with another genetic variant in the DI2? Is it because they've got a problem there? Is it because there's a problem there? Or is it a problem right at the end plate? So just because you're negative for that, we feel a bit bad because it doesn't necessarily mean that's the one that's causing you the problem. It could be a problem all along there at any point. So the key thing really to take home, I know it's a busy slide, is what's going on in the blood is still a little way away from what's going on in the tissues. And we're starting to try and unpick this. Now, the other thing that's very interesting to me is there's a genetic variant in D1 that makes a difference in how well you convert T4 to T3 in the bloodstream. And when, just by having a few thousand individuals, we can see very clearly with those who've got that variant, we see differences in their T4 and their T3 levels and their T3, T4 ratio. What is very interesting is we see no difference in the pituitary, the TSH at all. So changes in T3 and T4 are perceived by the pituitary and the, and the TSH level to be neutral. It doesn't seem to mind the difference. However, when you're looking at in the cells, it's quite likely we would see a difference there, but it's not necessarily picked up by TSH. So I've got this thing that TSH, I think, and I genuinely think this often will work for a lot of people and it's fine. It's in a small group of people, I think, where it may not work so well. So in those people, I call it an unreliable witness sometimes. So for those of you who are aware, there's been in Cambridge a study of a new genetic variant over the last 10 years called resistance to thyroid hormone. And these people are really interesting. Um, they have normal bloods. So if anything, their bloods are slightly hyperthyroid, but actually their tissues show low thyroid hormone levels. So their bloods are normal, but because they've got a problem with that very last step in the chain, they've actually got uh, hypothyroid tissues. And as you can see, they tend to very short. This is a growth chart. So they've got short legs. They've got problems with the bones. And also because the gut doesn't get enough thyroid hormone, they're terribly constipated. And we didn't find out about these people for ages because they've got normal thyroid function, but they've got a genetic variant that means we can't, um, we can't, uh, they can't process thyroid hormone properly. So that's obviously, it's rare, thankfully, 
and it's severe, but are there much less severe, such as that D2 variant or other variants, are there much less severe ones, but more common? And do they become a problem, say, if we start fiddling with the thyroid axis and we've got people on levothyroxine, we've altered the T3, T4 ratio, does that become a problem for these people? And I think this matters because what we can see quite over, and we have been showing over the last sort of a few years, is that normalization of TSH doesn't quite result in normalization of everything. You've got the T3, T4 ratio, you've got the BMI. And the liver gives us a bit of a clue because T3 action in the liver um, sets a balance between cholesterol and bile acids. So if you've got relatively low T3 in the liver, you'll put your cholesterol up. So the fact that cholesterol is not restored in people on levothyroxine, we don't get it quite back to normal. They run a slightly high LDL. That might imply that the liver is slightly T3 deficient, not absolutely massively T3 deficient, but it's there and we can detect it because we've seen the effect on the cholesterol. And this gets back to my point. Cholesterol is very easy to precisely measure. Well-being is not. So can we use this to try and help? So going back to this, what you might be able to argue is any effects that we're seeing on cholesterol and some of the things that cholesterol is linked to, that might be a reflection of what's going on here. And almost you can imagine it being an aggregate of everything else that's gone before it. So what's going on in the blood, what's going on in the transporters, what's going on with your DIO2, it might give us a readout for everything that's led up to that point. So that gives us a possibility that we might be able to identify high risk individuals. And uh, I was at a conference in America and I, um, I came across a beautiful uh, shop that uh, sold alcohol, tobacco and firearms. And I'm thinking, you probably can't get um, get anything much more uh, less safe than that, anything much more high risk. And then actually, um, I found this people took it further. They did it as a drive through option. So no, they're not only getting them, they're not getting any exercise and then throw in uh, archery items now in stock. So um, this is an example of going from, I think, uh, identifying people who are, shall we say, at potentially high risk. So I'd argue all these businesses are high risk. Can we find a high risk individual on levothyroxine? And the next slide I'm going to warn you is a little bit messy. So we'll work through it slowly together. And Lorraine, I might need you to sort of nod and make sure you're happy along with all of this as well. So um, if you remember my lovely little points before and the width, so this is um, this is a line of equality. These are our little point here. And basically, if you're all on one side, it means your TSH is pointing in one, your effects in one direction. So if you're on the left-hand side of the dotted line, you've got a negative effect. If you're on the, all on the positive side, you've got a positive effect. So we look at cholesterol, which is nice and easy. We have TSH is, this is in a group of healthy individuals, not on thyroid, not on any lipid lowering drugs or anything like that. We see as expected, higher TSH is associated with higher um, cholesterol. And we're quite confident about that. And it's all on one side of the dotted line. So everyone's happy. We see the opposite for T3 and T4, which is what we'd expect because they work the other way. And what you can see is T3 has slightly done a slightly better job than T4. But then we can start seeing some slightly odd things as well. So if you look at, um, if you look at this one, for example, uh, which is another component of cholesterol, you've got TSH and T4 pointing in the same direction, which doesn't make sense. So there's something going on beyond the blood that is how the thyroid processes. So for example, if we have a look at um, this marker in HDL, TSH has no effect on it whatsoever, but T3 and T4 do. So we can use this as a readout for what your tissue T3 and T4 levels are doing, which seems to be independent of your TSH. So we're now starting to find markers that actually may relate to your um, T3 thyroid status inside your cells and inside your tissues. And there's about 500 of these markers we can work through. So moving on to this one. So we've got these readouts that might work. So this is much nicer than sticking biopsies in people, basically. We might be able to use these to see 
actually what your T3 levels are going on inside your uh, tissues. We're working on the models for these. Now, some of you may have taken part in or be aware of the WATS trial. So this is the trial done by Prof Diane, and it was the largest trial done of T3 and T4 therapy in the UK. And it was a beautiful randomized controlled trial. It, for those of you who remember the trial, it didn't find any benefit of T3 and T4 versus T4 alone in the general population, but it did find in a subgroup of individuals who had this genetic variant in D2, it did find that actually in those who had that variant, there was some benefit. So we went back to the trial because we stored all their bloods in the freezer for many years afterwards. And actually, so this is a bit like, if you remember that slide I showed you about the depth study having a marker of misery. Um, what we looked at was the effect when you'd been on treatment of on T3. So we've got in the blue line here, this is those on T4 and the red line if you're on T3 and T4. And what we can see in the individuals where we actually found an improvement in their LDL. So we had a lower LDL, a lower medium LDL, a lower, uh, lower LDL. In all of those markers, if they got better, you were less miserable at the end of the study. So although overall we couldn't see an effect, in those where we actually saw an effect on the liver T3 levels, and therefore by proxy the brain T3 levels might well have gone up as well, we see, um, we see although that we see an improvement in the misery score. So what these markers for cholesterol might tell us is whether or not you're responding to thyroid hormone. And it also might give us a readout for those who might benefit, because if you've got a higher LDL, there might be an argument that you might benefit from a change in your treatment to see if that improves some of your other symptoms. And that's kind of where we're looking at going in the next trials. So there's not enough data at the moment to change practice at the moment, but what it looks like we are getting is our very first markers for um, sort of tissue thyroid status that we can easily get from the blood, but it also looks like we can use that to predict who's going to benefit from treatment. So Pete, just a question on yeah. that. Um, so where are you getting the, the data that the thyroid um, function in the cells is what you want it to be and correlating that with the, um, the, the LDL readings and the other markers that you're seeing? Sorry, I think you probably explained it, but you. No, no. So I'll, I'll go. It's, 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 so, um, so this was this was. So Where does this people, data come from? This is the what. So this is the what trial we've added on to that. So these are people who've been randomised to T three and T four. Mm -hmm. We didn't see a benefit overall overall from the whole study, but when you actually then looked at those where we could see a difference in these uh, markers on their sort of exit blood tests, so when they did all these questionnaires and when we assessed them all, they all had bloods done. So we've spent an absolute fortune processing all these molecules. We've stored them in the freezer for 20 years. And what we've been able to show is that those people who felt better, right. they were the ones where we also saw a difference in the lipids, which I'm would imply you. that we're seeing a tissue T3 effect. Right, I'm with you. So it's an implied tissue T3 effect rather than actually having somehow got... It, yeah, because we, yeah. we can't. The trouble is, I can't. The way to see what my your brain T three Lorraine was if I really wanted to drill down with no. the hole in your head, and uh, you're not Keep gonna back, nasty doctor with scalpel. <laughs> exactly, you're not going to want me to do that. No, so, but the liver might not be a bad proxy, and cholesterol is a really good proxy for that. And it's interesting that the ones that we see where T three has the most effect are also the ones where we see this effect when we're looking at things like mood and mm -hmm. thing is cholesterol we can measure it so very precisely to like 10 decimal places mm -hmm. it's much easier than say looking at how you're feeling and well-being mm -hmm. now if you are because lots of people you know depression fatigue it's all part of normal life especially in this last year mm -hmm. if you've got it for another reason it's not your t3 status giving you t3 won't make you feel any better mm -hmm. but if you've somebody where we can actually see you know, you're feeling better and you've shifted your lipid markers, which we're thinking is a proxy for T3. That gives us a bit more evidence to go, you know what, we actually are seeing a genuine effect here. We're seeing the fact, we're seeing a marker that we know is linked to T3 status in the liver. Mm. It's not a million miles away from what could be going on in the brain. Mm. And it's very interesting that we do see this benefit on T3 in people when we've actually been able to shift those markers in the liver. For those people whose tissue T3 was quite good and were miserable for another reason, 
it's quite makes sense. You won't see any improvement, mm. but it, it, it helps demuddy the water. Mm. No, and no, as I say, no. it's much nicer having an extra blood test than having a brain biopsy, I might argue. I don't think I'm going to get many people to sign up for that. Uh, interesting though, I am going to be a guinea pig over the next few weeks. There is a belt colleagues in Bristol have designed to measure tissue steroid levels, which is a bit like the um, thing you see some people with diabetes with the pumps going under the skin. Um, I'm going to be the first guinea pig of that. So um, that would, but I would still probably rather than wear a belt with a big needle inside me for 24 hours, I might rather have my uh, cholesterol and a few other things measured in more detail first than that. But mm -hmm. we are interested in these things. So that will be another study we might be recruiting for. Amazing. Um, so kind of just sort of wrap up and think and to give sort of a bit of food for thought is, so we know abnormal lipid profiles and hypothyroidism are linked. And as I've said before, if one's abnormal, most doctors and patients will actually ask to have the other one checked. So it is no surprise it goes together. It's important to raise that people on levothyroxine are at slightly increased risk of having problems with the lipids. So it's certainly not unreasonable to get your cholesterol checked periodically. It doesn't need to be every year when your thyroid is getting checked. But it's just worth bearing in mind that although you're on levothyroxine, which fixes your hypothyroidism, you've still got a slightly higher than average chance of having a slightly high cholesterol. So it's just something to bear in mind. Lipid metabolism is something that we can very readily measure with simple blood tests, and it's easy to identify it as a problem. And that's how we can link the two together. Um, the effects are sort of reduced T3 availability, gene expression tissues such as liver or the brain. So what we're seeing in the liver with cholesterol, we might see in the brains, so that could be fatigue and mood. It's not easily measured by clinicians, but I'd argue, I don't think many of you would worry slightly if your LDL was up by a fraction, but I think you'd worry if your fatigue levels were up even by a fraction. So it's just about finding a way that might help link the two together. So sort of preempting some of the questions that might be, because I've already said that T4 with normalization of TSH doesn't quite restore normality. The problem I've got at the moment is with T3, the preparations are quite short acting, the majority of them. They don't quite give you a normal profile either. It's a different profile than the levothyroxine one, but it's still not a normal profile. So it, it's not quite clear, particularly with, with the studies being done on the short acting T3, if it's actually made much of an, a difference to some of the people because the profile is very different to what is still normal. It's possibly less abnormal, but it's still far from normal. I think the game changer is going to be now that longer acting T3 is becoming available and there's real aims to get that move. And I think if longer acting T3 is becoming available, I think we've got a better chance of restoring um, normal profiles. And then becomes the $64 million question, do you feel better? Does that make a difference? Do people feel better? Does the fatigue, does the depression go away? Does the brain fog go away? And can we get that? And we kind of need to drive the evidence base for the T3. But it would be very interesting to be able to then deem money the water in these studies by using these sort of cholesterol markers to identify people, not only perhaps an increased risk to so actually go, we want you in this trial because your cholesterol is a bit wobbly, so we think you're T3 deficient, but also it's another way of assessing response to treatment as well, because it gives us a clue about what's going on inside cells. So um, I think the future is getting exciting again. And I think the Americans have moved more into this field as well. So Prof Bianco, who I did some of this work with, is um, president of the American Thyroid Association. And he's really interested in looking at this whole T3 dynamic. And his group is actually currently making a long acting form of T3. So they're currently taking that through trials at the moment. So I think that is becoming um, a, a sort of a reality over the next few years because there's a several now being pursued. So that long awaited Holy Grail is now literally just around the corner. So I think that's everything from me. Um, thank you so much for listening. And I hope I've uh, given you some interest and sort of made you think about a few things as well.